top. Wow, there's a big turnout. And they start building their contact books here, the Oxford Union, the university's very own House of Commons for Beginners. Students debate here every week alongside leading political figures from all over the world. By some coincidence, tonight's topic is social mobility. The onus is on the proposition to show not just that birth is important and influential in people's lives, but that this is more influential than ability. And conversely... This evening, they're joined by Tony Blair's former chief speechwriter. I was intrigued by the reception that um, was given to two speeches of such obvious intellectual mediocrity. I was reminded... <laughs> and a senior broadsheet commentator. Of 80,000 15-year-olds on free school meals in 2002, only 45 got into Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, on a second note, I'd like to argue with the notion that university entrance is the sole arbiter of success in life. I would much rather someone be happy. The motion is passed. This House does believe that today birth matters more than ability. And the leg up from the connections made right here at the union matters too. Why do so many presidents of this union go on to become politicians? Uh, I think because, um, well, obviously a lot of presidents are very, very politically interested. You get a good training in debating, um, in how to run an institution. Um, you meet a lot of politicians when you're doing it, so it kind, of, it kind of gives you some sense of the excitement of politics. Do they look like a bunch of budding politicians in there? Well, they all are, aren't they? That's what the union is. It's just breeding yeah. grabber politicians, but the debates are interesting, so I'll come yeah. anyway. But that's, that's what they all do it for. It sort of it gives you a sense of the kind of continuity of the institution. Um, the list of former members here is a roll call from the front rank of political history. Nigel Lawson, he was Christchurch. Ken Baker, Maudlin. And the current cabinet. Oh, who's this chap in the kilt here? That's got to be. That's uh, Michael Gove. Michael um, Gove. Ex-president, who is now the uh, government minister for schools and education. And it's not just the top posts in the coalition government that are dominated by Oxbridge. Fewer leading Labour figures may have gone to public school, but all five of last year's leadership contenders went to Oxford or Cambridge. So did a third of the shadow cabinet. Labour leader Ed Miliband went to Corpus Christi, a 2-1 in, you've guessed it, PPE, then pretty quickly into a job in Gordon Brown's office. Defeated David Miliband went to the same college. He got a first in PPE before going to a think tank and then on to advise Tony Blair. Shadow Chancellor Ed Bowles went to Keeble to study, yes, PPE. He too went on to work for Gordon Brown. At Oxford, he met his future wife, Yvette Cooper, now Shadow Home Secretary. She did PPE at Balliol before advising the late John Smith. Leadership contender, now Shadow Education Secretary, Andy Burnham, broke the pattern slightly. English at Fitzwilliam, Cambridge, but then off to advise Blair's Culture Secretary, Chris Smith. And they all ended up in the same place. Safe Labour seats in the Commons. If you give people a platform, they will and they can achieve. Labour conference in Manchester. There's no better place than this to spot the next generation of researchers and special advisors. They're the ones welded to their blackberries. So what can I tell you about these exotic creatures called spads, which is Westminster speak for a special advisor? Well, they come straight down from Oxford and Cambridge and go into the Westminster village. They join as researchers, not very well paid, or one of the think tanks, many of them splattered around Westminster. And very soon they work their way up the political greasy pole. Before long, they can become special advisors to well-known politicians on both front benches. And that's, that's the start of their political career. Before you know it, they become MPs themselves and then front benchers. And just as today's spads are tomorrow's politicians, today's top politicians are yesterday's spads. That includes all three main party leaders. Few of these young graduates have had a job outside politics. No, 
Now, if David Miliband decides not to take the job of Shadrach Chancellor... And it isn't just Labour. I broadcast from all three of the big party conferences. So many of his supporters are still spitting tacks about his defeat. And this new breed of professional political animal inhabits each of them. Thank you. It's very kind with, with of pleasure, you. Thank you. Pleasure, Thank you pleasure. very much. The Tories are the poshest. Both Cameron and Osborne's chiefs of staff are Eton old boys. And the female Tory spads tend to be just as upmarket. Rodine, St Paul's or Fetty's. To be a spad of any party is to be on the fast track to the top, and it hugely narrows the range of our politicians. That was all right. And they know all about that narrowing here in Stoke-on-Trent, about as Labour heartland as it gets. Rather than meet the new local MP, public school and Cambridge-educated Tristram Hunt, a close ally of Peter Mandelson, I'm meeting a man who's lived and worked all his life in the area, a man who last year was blocked by Labour HQ from even standing in the internal ballot that selected the parliamentary candidate. Before he resigned, Gary Owlsby had been in the Labour Party for 30 years. Somebody born into on a terrace like this could they make it into politics today? I think today you must be an Oxbridge type fellow. Well, that's as far as I can, as far as I can um, see. Did you go to Oxford? No. no Cambridge. No, no. Open university. Univers open university. <laughs> that's the only place for somebody like me. You think if you'd gone to Oxbridge, if you'd been better connected in the Labour Party, if you I... might you might now be MP for this city. If I had been a friend of Lord Mandelson uh, and I had gone to Cambridge or Oxford, I would have been the MP for Stoke-on-Trent today. So having a network of friends that you gain in London and gain from going to an elite university, all that gives you yeah. a leg up? Yes, it does. And then you have to be a photocopy boy or a messenger boy or something like that. You have to get inside that inner circle. And when you're inside that inner circle, Mandelson's children, as they're called, they're implanted all over the country to do the bidding of those people in London mm. and not necessarily to be a voice of the people of the, the areas where they were born. It crucifies me to believe that this has actually happened to a working class party. Sounds to me that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Not according to Ed Miliband. It's all going to be rosy from now on. I'd like to see any some hard evidence that ordinary local people will be automatically on those shortlists and not automatically kept off them. I put to Peter Mandelson the allegation that he and others were responsible for keeping ordinary working class people off local shortlists. To my surprise, he agreed that politics has got too posh. You know, when I was young and growing up, you know, politicians were drawn from a whole variety of different professions. Now you're seeing the emergence of a generation of professional politicians. It's almost as if you had to be some MP's research assistant or a political advisor to a minister or, or a party worker or an official in a public sector trade union to get on in politics. So you're not just seeing the, things getting posher, you're seeing things getting narrower as well. Easy for him to say, now, but there's more. The man who did more than anybody to reduce the influence of the trade unions on Labour now blames them for not helping more ordinary people into politics. The trade unions, which used actually many decades ago to be a good recruiting ground actually for people coming from... From ordinary people? Ordinary, solid, working class, people who haven't made it, people who don't were certainly never born uh, with a silver spoon in their mouth. Now the, the trade unions too seem to be looking to that sort of professional political class. They should be doing a better job at recruiting more working class people into the Labour Party and into elected office. Whatever you think of them, the union certainly used to get people from humble origins to the top of the party they created. Then I'm sure the response of our people to make a new Britain will be as magnificent as the workers of Russia and other countries have been to improve their country. Men like Ernie Bevan, who went from Transport Union General Secretary to Foreign Secretary. 
and John Prescott, who went from ship steward to shop steward to deputy prime minister. But Alan Johnson seems to be the last in that line of trade unionists who've made it to the top. He became Home Secretary, but he spent years here at Slough's sorting office as a postie. Good morning. Where's Alan Johnson? Oh, there he is. Good morning, Alan. Uh, Hi, Andrew. Good How you to doing? see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Just bring back some... All right, George. Yeah, see you later. Just bring back just some memories. I've known this guy since he was 16. He was a telegram boy uh, when I was here. And this is the old delivery I used to do as well. When you were doing this, did you ever think you would end up in a political career? No, never. No. Never, never at all. I delivered to Dorney Wood, which was the residence in those days yeah. of either the Foreign Secretary or the Home Secretary. It varied. Is that the place John Prescott got? That's right, that's right. <laughs> so and I said to John, croquet? well, I told John <laughs> when I became you an delivered M. delivered the mail there. I said to, no, I said to John, I said, you're at, you go to Dorney Wood? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, it's really nice as you walk in the front door and there's the... I said, I never walked in the front door, John. I went to the servants' quarters delivering the mail. <laughs> you did, you had to go round the back yeah. and just put the bundle of mail in. It was the unions that gave him a ladder to the top of politics. For someone of his generation and background, it was the only route in. I can't think of any other route where people came in other than the trade union movement without the Ox university background, usually Oxbridge background. You had Nye Bevins and the Ernie Bevins, all of whom came for the trade union, and more recently, John Prescott and me. What's the other route that escaped that uh, treadmill? Can't think of one. But is that ladder still there today? Well, yeah. number one, of course, the trade union movement is not so... Uh, it's not the pipeline it was. It's not, well, it's still there. It's not as huge as it was, 13 million members in my day. It's not the pipeline it was, no. It pr probably could be again. It's about 60 new MPs came in at the last election. And you look at the backgrounds of these Labour MPs, they're pretty middle class. We can only see, out of the 60, about six yeah. coming from what you would describe as ordinary working-class backgrounds. Yeah. Now, that's Labour. Yeah, uh, well, as I say, I think that's changing. I think, you know, in constituency parties, they're going to be looking for a mix. Now, will you get the people going and standing for those positions who haven't got that kind of background? How you perhaps train them to go to these constituency selection meetings you were talking yeah. about, the confidence that a university gives you? Well, you've, if you haven't had that, you haven't had the huge benefit that a trade union career gives you, incidentally. H how can you help people? None of the parties has been much good in recent years at encouraging people from ordinary backgrounds to stand for election. Of course, diversity has become very fashionable, getting more women, more ethnic minorities, more openly gay candidates. Even the Tories are all for it, but by and large, they all come from the same posh backgrounds. One new black Tory MP even went to Eton. What about some social diversity? We've had all women shortlists who become MPs. What about some old state school shortlists? Well, I think at, at that stage, it's, gonna, it's an issue about income. Right? I mean, those are the barriers that prevent people at that stage from going into politics. Getting into politics is an expensive business. My fear is we're going back to a time when only those with money can afford to become MPs. When you see the leaders of this coalition, Mr. Cameron, Mr. Hume, was Mr. Laws as well, Mr. Clegg, it's kind of back to the 50s, isn't it? They're not just posh, they are moneyed as well. It's well, sort of like the kind of younger version of Harold Macmillan's cabinet. It is an issue that concerns me a great deal. And when I'm going around trying to, to encourage people to think about standing for politics, it's, it is an obvious barrier. And it's not until you begin that process, you always realize just how bad those financial barriers are. Financial barriers are yet another obstacle blocking ordinary people's route into politics. One result, the feeling that the leaders of the coalition and their families are immune from the impact of their own policies. As they force through sweeping cuts